Welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts. This show is going to be in and around Keene. We're going to talk a little bit about the Pumpkin Fest, and we're going to talk about the new VA clinic that was opened up recently in Keene. The, the first part we're going to talk about is the Pumpkin Fest. <clears throat> this year's Pumpkin Fest was different than the other 20 Pumpkin Fests. Um, one of the biggest concerns that um, I heard and one of the biggest concerns I had was Friday night when I went walking around town with my wife on Friday about 9 o'clock and it was basically kind of from Athens Pizza all the way up. It was kind of like a dead city. It was almost as if we and the people of Keene were afraid to come out. There was... I think the lack of the community night really had a, a negative effect on the, on the pumpkin fest. Stores were closed, and it just didn't seem right after the numerous um, pumpkin fest. No children, no families. There was it was just missing something Friday. But when I went down from Athens Pizza South um, towards the post office and towards the um, the college. We had mobs and mobs of um, teenagers and, and young adults. It was almost for some reason we gave up our town that night to a, a mob. And a lot of them weren't even Keene State College students. But there was drinking, drinking, drinking. Um, it was underage drinking. It was obvious they were underage drinking. My biggest disappointment about that was I thought the drug and alcohol, especially the alcohol control, would be around. I did not see anybody from the alcohol bureau going around checking IDs or, or stopping people. And why? That's a good question. Again, without a doubt, there was underage drinking. The police in Keene did a great job, but they just couldn't handle everything. And so... One of the big questions is why weren't the alcohol enforcement agency around Keene, or if they were in Keene, why didn't they not make a noticeable presence? Overall, on Saturday, I thought the Pumpkin Fest went really well. I had no negative complaints. I heard no negative complaints. People enjoyed the food court where it was. The kids complained because there was no bouncing tiger and other slides but maybe they'll fix that next year if they have a, a pumpkin fest. The other part, I got up Sunday morning, went around Keene, downtown. In a lot of ways, I was totally d disgusted. When I left about quarter of 10 last night, we were having the cleanup. It was looking pretty good. Then all of a sudden, I don't know what the heck happened. It was as if maybe after 10 o'clock, everybody just went wild. Something went wrong. We need to find out what went wrong. And we need to find out who are these people causing the problem. <clears throat> if they're out-of-towners, they need to be held accountable. We need to enforce the ordinance. If people are parking on sidewalks and parking in driveways, parking on the grass, we have city ordinance for those. They need to be enforced. Maybe they need to pay 100 or $200 for violating the ordinance. So this is from my point of, my point of view. We got about a nine minute video clip and not to um, pick on Ruth Sterling, I saw her Sunday morning with a broom and a shovel help cleaning up. And, but she can't clean it up all for by herself. She made a yeoman's effort to pull this off for Keen. In a lot of ways it came off really well, but there's still a few problems and we need to find out who's causing those problems. And so his like I said, a nine-minute nine video clip, not the greatest, but I was walking around keen, and so you can judge for yourself. Seventeen cars. At one time, there was 22 cars parked here.
doesn't appear at the cleanup when is as planned last night. Well, nowhere near as bad as it was last year. Still has a way to go compared to some of the past cleanups. Again, there was really no need for this, and some people just don't understand the dangers of this. As a gentleman on his bike went through a patch of slippery pumpkins and fell. Yeah. As two residents of Keene have already told me this morning, there's, there's what a mess. But one good thing about it is all the stinky porta potties are all gone. I was here last night at about 9.45 before I started walking home. It wasn't this bad. So, it appears that much of this trash was done probably after 10 o'clock after the police left the area. Without question, <clears throat> even though some has been pushed out, some of the smashed pumpkins have been pushed out at about 9.20 last night, this area was clean of pumpkins. As volunteers cleaned out this whole area. Because I know there was at least 15 to 20 volunteers under the watchful eyes of the police which picked up all the pumpkins here which cleaned it out here it is some of the vendors, they just left their trash here. They didn't bother picking it up or cotton away as they left. Again, more smashing pumpkins. Again, there was volunteers here last night. This was a clean area. So it comes down. What do we do about the people who have no connection with the pumpkin fest, whose only desire is to go out and raise ha ha havoc. No excuse for this trash. This trash should have been taken out last night, not left around. Thank you. 
some people did a much better job. Look at Athens Pizza. All intents and purposes, pretty clean. No different than a normal Saturday night. Other places, a lot of drinking establishments, quite different. Cobblestone, Domino's Pizza, again, quite clean. I don't know if it was crowd control or the fact that they were just good stewards of the community and ensured everything was picked up before they went home for the night. Cumberland Farms, we did very well. Yesterday with the pumpkin fest. It's not even 10 o'clock, and it's just about cleaned up. It looks like they hired a maintenance person, clean up person. And I would suspect within the next 15, 20 minutes, the only thing about the pumpkin fest you'll see is these Jersey, Jersey barriers. Again, Cumberland Farms a good citizen. They need to be commended. Dunbar Street, where a lot of the party action was taking place. But the students that live on Dunbar Street, they also need to be commended. Even thought they were partying hardy, partying hard. Dunbar, compared to like Water and Willow and Grove, Foster and Davis Street, is a pretty clean place. Nothing wrong with partying as long as you pick up after yourself. It's right here yesterday afternoon. Yeah. When uh, we left to go to Connecticut. They were here Friday night, too. Yeah. And this is the problem is they were drinking heavily. Yeah. There was a lot of underage drinking. That. Cars on the sidewalk in violation of the code. Yeah, but you didn't see the code enforcement or the cops come through. The question is, if someone had an emergency. Oh, yeah. You couldn't get into here. You're right. You're right. I'm now here with my guest, Rick Blood, candidate for mayor of Keene. Hi, Chris. How's it going, Rick? It's going good. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. In two weeks, you got the election coming up, November 8th. You're hoping for more people to show, out than, show up than instead of the 400 in the primary? Uh, there, there should be a better turnout than the 3% <laughs> that turned out in the primary. And I, I don't know if that was just because, really, there was nothing to be decided. So a lot of people figured they'd just stay home for that. So... <clears throat> I don't know what the thoughts are. I think it is a good idea that the city has decided that unneeded primaries will not happen. Yeah, you say easily save five to six thousand dollars. And disruptions in the schools, because I know that, of course, I vote Ward Three votes at Fuller, Fuller school. school, so you know that displaces the kids out of that multi-purpose room for the day. So, you know. <clears throat> so, what are some of your issues or concerns about the, the city coming up? All right. Uh, the parking, parking funds. We want to raise our revenue as far mm. as parking goes. My idea is to run the parking meters till 11 o'clock at night. That's the only really smart thing to do. You don't Ooh. raise your parking, you don't have to raise your parking rates, you don't have to put in a whole new parking system. You just have to run the meters longer. Well, if you use, then the locals will know that there's no... Um person trekking the meters after five o'clock so they may not use them but all the people that visitors come out of town and say well if i'm from boston or new york i have to pay till 11 12 o'clock at night so they would automatically well, put money the in. locals would too Some, yeah. because who says there would be nobody checking the meters police officers we've got guys that wear blue uniforms that's, that, that's yes. fully in the 
in their job description. Sure. So, you know, you, you don't need to hire extra parking people. Just as the, you know, and personally, I would like to see two or three or four cops on the beat in the evenings downtown walking and sure they can glance at a meter and it doesn't take long mm, to write a ticket to write a ticket electronic the, the electronic tickets so what about the the center of town your central square central square i think that will uh mend itself i think it's one of those things you know right now the group of kids is down there uh it's just a certain group of kids eventually they'll grow up and they'll Chances are they'll move out of town. They'll go to college. Uh, they may even go to Keene State and become another problem in Keene. <laughs> um, but that, you know, it's a lot of hubbub really about nothing. They're kids. There's no place to go. Downtown is, is an area where the kids can converge without you know, the east side kids that want to hang out with the west side kids, you know, where are they going to hang out? It's Robin Hood Park in the east, Wheelock Park in the west. And if they don't want to go to either one of those, if they want to meet somewhere in the middle, that's Central Square. Then you go Wheelock Park. Wheelock Park is a great area for the city of Keene, and it's used all the time, so there's really not much place to hang out there. Oh, there's plenty of places to hang out there. There's the whole back section, there's pine trees, where people could hang out and not even be seen. When you're talking about no place to, to go, it's really kind of strange, or maybe it's a little set. If you're 18 to 23 and you're going to college, there's places for you to hang out. But if you're 18 to 23 and not going to college, you're not welcome in the college group, and there's really no place for you to go in Keene. So what happens? Right, and you know, that's, as a kid, may, uh, Maybe things were different. Maybe we were just breaking the law when I was a kid. But as a teenager, we would spend a lot of time at the college and not really get kicked out. We would go in and we'd use the squash courts, you know, the, the more or less public areas of the college. If there were lectures in the evenings at the science center, we would go and sit in on those if they were talking about something we were interested in. And you didn't have to be part of the college community. You just had to be part of the community. But colleges are getting more and more expensive, and some colleges just becoming a community among themselves. Right, right. And I think that's what the growth at Keene State is what gets me. It's just keep growing and growing and pushing the limits. And why the city hasn't, you know, demanded that, look, you... And I thought we had <laughs> said, okay, look, you guys... Don't cross Main Street, don't cross Winchester Street. You know, stay in your corner. And nope, now they've expanded across Main Street. They're expanded down into your neighborhood, which <laughs> happens to be where I grew up. <laughs> was Main Street. My playground was the Kingsbury's parking lot down at the end of Myrtle Street, climbing around <laughs> on all the unsafe, greasy machines <laughs> down there. And you know, kids can't even do that anymore. So if you had one, what would be the one thing that you think would be the most important to the King's future? Information. Information to the community? Information or? to the community from the city, from every single department in the city, you know, at a, on a regular basis. I mean, and shows like this and Town Crier and No Spin, they all help, but it's not enough. You know, it's you not enough for you guys to chase these department heads around to try and, and get them in here, try and get them to, to give a statement as to what's going on in the city. Unacceptable. They should be wanting to come forward and say, look, you know, Corp Bloomquist should come on and say, look, I'm really excited. This is what we're doing in Keene. You know, we're working on this project, we're working on this project. Yeah, it's going to be a hassle getting around this neighborhood because we're doing stuff here, but the more information the public gets, the better. You know what? I'm going to work and get caught boom here because he, his office ticks off a lot of people when there's road work or road painting right. or whatever. 
if you had information that would save a lot of grief. It would. Okay. And, uh, you know, one of my kind of half comedy, half s serious bits has to do with the fact that if people in a neighborhood complain about the, the fact that their road's not getting paved, take up a collection. <laughs> you know, if, if every homeowner in a neighborhood pitches in a hundred bucks, boom, have your street paved. I'm sure the city wouldn't complain. <laughs> no. Nope. Yeah, they would probably be happy. Well, good luck on your election. Thank you, Chris. And thanks for having me. Thanks for running. Now we're going to talk about um, a new and exciting um, event in Keene, the opening of the v VA um, Outreach Clinic on uh, Marlboro Street in the old Ranger Curran building. It opened up on the um, 14th. The grand opening was the 14th. It had been opened up for about a month. And I will have a clip concerning showing the open house and um, the ribbon cutting ceremony, the whole works that goes with that. That'll last for about 30 minutes. Also, prior to that clip, I have a clip for about three minutes from the home health care. And the home health care has a bus service that every Wednesday that will go up to White River Junction and Dotman Hitchcock Hospital. One of the big benefits of this home health care service is that it has the ability to carry, to transport three wheelchair, up to three wheelchair bound patients. Something that the DAV cannot do, and I'm not sure about the, um, the Red Cross. You can still call the Red Cross to coordinate um, care. Also, you can coordinate, coordinate with the Red Cross to get transportation if you live in Keene or maybe around the Keene area to get to the clinic and you still continue to call the Red Cross to get up to White River Junction using either the Red Cross or the DAV um, vehicles. Also, the city bus is setting up service, so you, they'll have a drop-off point there. So again, you can get with the city of Keene and find out what, when their schedule is going to be. And so you'll have three to four different options to get to um, the clinic if you do not have a vehicle or you don't have access. Another important thing about the clinic, even though it's the Veterans Clinic and you have the Veterans Outreach Center, which is for um, combat service vets who may need mental health treatment or just to sit down and talk, not every, contrary to popular belief, not every veteran has the ability or the right to use the um, VA clinic. You have to go in and make sure you qualify and there's two ways to qualify. You have to either go to White River Junction or Manchester and go to the eligibility office. And if you have a service connectivity, you're automatically qualified. If you do not have a service co connectivity, you have to apply. And basically, you really have to be poor or low income to be able to get VA services and not everyone will be able to qualify. If you make too much money, you will not qualify. If you make in between, you'll be able to qualify, but you'll have to pay co-payments. So again, if you're interested, try to find out if you qualify, go to the Eligibility Center either at Manchester or White River Junction. So I'm not gonna be coming back at the end of this show to sign off, so I'm gonna sign off right now. I'll see you on the long road, and hopefully this, imp this clip about the VA, <coughs> the VA clinic will be beneficial to you. Okay, thank you. Healthcare Hospice and Community Services, and welcome aboard the HCS Medical Transportation Van. This is our brand new vehicle that will hold 11 passengers or room and has room for three wheelchairs aboard. We are making transportation available to veterans to come here to the new VA clinic on Marlboro Street. And once a week, we're taking the vehicle north with our driver, Chuck Matthews, to White River Junction and to Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. People just need to call HCS or they need to call the Red Cross and we're coordinating with them to make sure that people can get wheelchair accessible transportation to their medical appointments when they need it. And one of the critical things you just said is the wheelchair because DAV and Red Cross can't provide wheelchair. And second, you also said that it was going to um, Dotman Hitchcock yes. and that was one of the problems the DAV van 
it could only go to White River Junction. Then they would have to hop on the local bus to go to Dartmouth Hitchcock and trying to get back in time. So we'll take veterans of any age and the services available for a donation. Okay. The other question is, we have some older veterans and they can't get along very well with themselves. Could their spouse or a family member escort them up there? Yes, we do encourage people to bring a friend or a relative to be with them on their medical appointment, and we have room to take them on this vehicle too. Because that was one of the critical shortcomings when I was doing the DAV. We couldn't send family members up, and I had one individual who was 87 years old, and his wife felt really uncomfortable because sometimes we'd have to leave like 7 o'clock in the morning and him not get back until like 4 o'clock. And so, you sir? My name is Chuck Matthews. I am the operator of the van. Uh, our drivers are all commercial drivers. We have passenger bus endorsement. We're trained in uh, wheelchair securement. Uh, and I look forward to uh, taking the vets up. I'm a vet myself. Okay. And you sir, with the vet center hat? Uh, I'm Harry Kostick. I'm the transportation manager for home health care. I'm the one who sees that uh, this vehicle gets on the road, and uh, we work with the Red Cross very closely. Um, we are very, very much into doing transportation for the veterans, and I'm a veteran as well myself. And like the, the lady said, we're talk, you accept donations to help cover the cost of the vehicle. Yes, we do. Anything they want to give will help. <laughs> okay, because you're not for a profit. You're no, we're not, not for profit organization. Okay, and with the high price of gas, anybody yes. who donates can help keep you on the road. Correct. These are federally funded vehicles, so there's, uh, yeah, the dollar's always an issue, but uh, we're making it happen. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'm delighted here to join everyone today for the ribbon cutting event for the Keene VA Outpatient Clinic and Vet Center. It's great, it is good to see a great turnout from our Keene community partners, our congressional leadership we work with day to day, and of course our local veterans and their families. It's such an uplifting feeling to finally have a VA presence here in the key area. It is, long, it is a long overdue event from numerous inquiries over the years from our local veterans who have traveled all the way to White River Junction year after year to the heated discussions that have taken place at the Keene Red Cross luncheon over the past 16 months and finally to the recent newspaper article speculating if the clinic and vet center were indeed ever going to happen. And I'm here to say yes, it is going to happen. We're here and we're absolutely glad to be here. Uh, it was in a letter to the New Hampshire and Vermont Congressional Delegation dated January 15, 2009, that Dr. James Speed, Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs at that time, approved a new vet center and outreach clinic that would be totally located here in Keene, New Hampshire. It was to, to, to complement the community-based clinic that was planned at that time and, of course, is now open in Brownboro, Vermont. We thank the Congressional Delegation for their efforts to provide greater access to primary care for veterans in the Keene area. I'm extremely confident in the dedicated professional team we have working for area veterans here at this VA outpatient clinic and the neighboring vet center. Dr. Carol Blackwood is the right person for the job of medical director of this facility. She's a smart, very competent medical practitioner and also a Navy veteran. We've had the pleasure of having her work at White River Junction for the last six months. And quite frankly, it's going to be hard to get her up for this position. She, she took to the VA system like she's been working here for years. She has a patient population at White River Junction that's almost ready to drive here for care the other way around. Uh, and to round out the Keene team, Dr. Blackwood also has two very capable staff nurses already working with her. Jennifer Vigilis, RN, and Jonathan Howe, LPN. And the staff here will provide the best clinical kind of care backed by the, the most evidence-based practices available in this country. We are honored to have several guest speakers with us here today. First, I'd like to introduce a very special individual who took the lead in this cause and has a personal interest in ensuring veterans in this area get what they've been pleading for for years. She's someone that doesn't easily take no for an answer, and luckily for the veterans of this community, she wouldn't take no or be patient as the appropriate answer when others were telling her the clinic has, was just somewhere around the corner. Senator Shaheen was the, was the first woman in history to be elected both governor and a United States senator. Uh, senator Shaheen has always been very involved in the New Hampshire community. 
She's taught at New Hampshire High School, chaired the town of Banbury's zoning board, and served three years in the state senate. Senator Shaheen became the first woman elected governor of New Hampshire, serving three terms from 1997 to 2003. And in 2008, Senator Shaheen became the first woman elected to the United States Senate from New Hampshire. As a champion of the middle class, as governor, Senator Shaheen worked to make college more affordable, make public kindergarten a reality for over 25,000 additional children, and extended affordable health coverage to tens of thousands of New Hampshire children. Her focus on the economy led to the creation of nearly 67,000 new jobs during her six years as governor and the third highest tech employment in the nation. Recognizing that New Hampshire's middle class to prosper, we must be able to compete in an increasing global economy. She was the first New Hampshire governor to lead a trade mission outside of North America. A former, former small business owner, Senator Dean understands that small businesses are the backbone of the New Hampshire economy. In 2005, she took on the challenge of forging a new generation of public leaders when she became the director of Harvard University's Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School of Government. Senator Sheen chairs the Committee on Foreign Relations Subcommittee on European Affairs and the Energy and National, Re National Resources Committee Subcommittee on Water and Power. Senator Sheen is also a member of the Armed Services Committee and the Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Jean Shaheen. Thank you very much, Bob, for that very generous introduction. And I'm so excited to be here with all of you this afternoon. And despite the rain, it is a very good day in Keene, right? I was here with many of you last fall when we came and looked at this space after the decision was made that this was where the vet's clinic was going to be located and uh, it's really um, so gratifying to see how beautiful it looks i look forward like all of you to a tour in a little bit to see what the whole facility has turned out to be today's opening is really as bob said the combination of years of effort on the part of the veterans community in the Keene area to try and make sure that there were health care services and other services that veterans need in this area close to home so that people didn't have to drive um, up to White River Junction um, as important and nice as that facility is, Bob. Um, it's, having, it's having a place in the community that's close for veterans. Um, so having this here will make such a difference for so many people in the future. And I, I just want to recognize some of the people who have made today's clinic a reality. First of all, I want to thank Bob and everybody at White River Junction. Um, it's nice to have so many of you here for this opening this afternoon and really appreciate all the work that you've done. And I'm very pleased that we have Dr. Michael Mayo-Smith, who is the Director of Region 1 Veterans Integrated Services Network with us. And uh, Dr. Mayo-Smith actually lives in Franklin, so he's a New Hampshireite, so he understands um, for many reasons just why this facility is so important to the people of the Keene area. Um, also, we're very pleased that Robert Sornetsky, who is the GSA Region 1 Director, is here. Um, it's great to have you here, and thank you for all of the work that you've done to get this project moving um, when it got stalled. And, of course, happy to have Bob Busby here as well. And I also want to recognize Dwight Clark, who is the past commander for Keene American Legion Post 4. He has worked for so long on behalf of the veterans in this area to try and make this clinic happen. And I know that Mayor Pregent is not able to be here, but certainly this has had the support from the city um, and all of the leadership of the city. So I want to just close by saying just a word about how important this clinic is, not just now, but as we think about the future. As of this month, 
we will have had almost 32,000 soldiers who have been wounded in action in Iraq. Um, more than 14,000 have been wounded in Afghanistan. We have a new generation of veterans who are returning from war. And sadly, they bear the scars that they've earned in the defense of our freedom, just as so many of you from previous generations have. And all of the veterans, those of you who are here and those who are returning, young and old, have done everything that this country has asked of you. And so I'm very glad that now we can keep the promise that we made to you um, that when you came back to the Keene area that we would be able to have health care services and the other services that you need um, right here in your own community. So congratulations to everybody who's been involved in this effort. It's terrific. It's so exciting to see it finally come to fruition. Thank you very much. Uh, next, from the office of Senator Kelly Ayette, we have Steve Monger. Steve? Thank you and good afternoon. I bring greetings from Senator Kelly Ayotte, and uh, she extends her warmest welcome to everyone. Um, she asked me to read a letter and, and uh, give a very brief remarks. Uh, Certainly, as a military spouse, Senator Ayat is uh, very concerned about uh, our nation and its commitments to our veterans. Uh, her husband was an Iraqi war veteran, uh, still serves in the Air National Guard. Um, she asked me to read this letter. I want to commend the White River Junction VA Medical Center staff and the staff at the Keene Outpatient Clinic on the grand opening of this facility. This clinic is a testament to our nation's commitment to provide better health care to our veterans and is a great step forward in better serving our veterans from the greater Keene region. We welcome the expertise that Dr. Blackwood and staff bring to the clinic, including primary care, women's health services, and with the Vet Center, mental health care for our combat veterans. I want to thank everyone involved for making the Keene Outpatient Clinic a reality and stand ready to assist the clinic and the veterans wherever I can. Sincerely, Kelly Ayotte, United States Senator. Thank you, Steve. Next, from the office of Congressman Charles Bass, we have Mr. Chris Collins. <coughs>
Let me express my gratitude to the Veterans Administration, the New Hampshire Congressional Delegation, and all the partners represented here for the work done to make this new facility a reality. As a member of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, I am pleased to see timely access to quality VA health care being expanded closer to where veterans live. We understand our commitment to our soldiers does not end when they return home. Quality health care should not be thought of as a privilege to be enjoyed by a few, but as a return to, as a return earned through the honorable service. I want to thank Dr. Uh, Michael Mayo Smith and Mr. Robert Walton for their leadership, vision, and commitment to the American, vet, American veterans. I also want to thank the dedicated VA professional staff for this steadfast service to our <coughs> service members, veterans, and their families. Finally, I want to thank my congressional colleagues for their support of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Sincerely, Bernard Sanders, United States Senator. Thank you. and lease of this clinic space, we have great partners in the General Services Administration. And here to represent the General Services Administration, we have Mr. Robert Zabetsky, the Regional Manager for GSA. Johnson. Where's Dave? 
Dave Johnson's the guy who should have picked that screw up off the, uh, <laughs> off, off the pavement. Dave Johnson is going to be the uh, facilities manager, the project uh, property manager here at the facility, and he's the guy to call if you have any issues whatsoever. <laughs> now, I'll take the call, but he's going to end up with it. It's going to flow that way. I also want to point out that um, a project like this doesn't happen just because GSA is doing it. We did have wonderful partners at the VA, and we had, um, how shall I put this, wind behind our sails from Washington all the time, and uh, we do appreciate the support and the encouragement that we got from the entire delegation, and particularly Senator Shaheen. Um, we were trying to figure out how to, how to sort of celebrate this event, because this one is a really important one for us. Uh, we do do projects all over the place for federal agencies, and every agency has got an important mission. But the VA's mission and the mission here at this facility is truly unique and, and truly significant. So we wanted to do more than just cut a ribbon. I have uh, asked the staff, and they've put together a plaque, and if I could get Dr. Blackwood to come on up for a second. very simple black. We thought about what we might say on it. We thought about trying to go through books of poetry and find something nice to say. There's lots of, that has been said, but we ultimately ended up with a plaque that says, we thank you for your service. We hope that you will put this somewhere in the clinic to let folks know that we at the GSA appreciate everything that veterans have done for us. Thank you.
serving a population of over 1.2 million veterans. The network employs over 10,000 staff. Prior to his appointment, Dr. Mailsmith served as the National Chief Consultant for Primary Care since 2006. From 1999 to 2006, he served as Director of Primary Care Service Line for the VA New England Healthcare System. He began his VA career at the Manchester VA Medical Center, where he held several positions of increasing responsibility. Dr. Mailsmith received his bachelor's degree in science from Amherst College and received his medical degree from Hanover University in Philadelphia. He later received his master's in public health from Harvard School of Public Health. He has been on the faculty of Harvard and Dartmouth Medical Schools and has published numerous research articles in the areas of clinical epidemiology and primary care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Mailsmith. much father. Good afternoon everyone and uh, it's a special pleasure for me to be here. It's one of the things I enjoy most in my role as network director because when we open these clinics we're bringing services closer to the veterans and the veterans are what we're here for. New Hampshire happens to be a state rich in military history and actually Keene uh, started, it was founded uh, with the intention of being a fort town uh, to protect and defend uh, the province of Massachusetts Bay during the French and Indian Wars. So the military history in this area goes many, many years back. Providing exceptional health care clinic, we have what many consider to be the finest uh, electronic medical record in the world. The doctors who come here uh, and see the patients, they not only have all the information immediately available from the care they give, but they can actually get immediately available all the care that they received at any VA in the country. Uh, they can bring up x-rays, they can bring up CAT scans, they can bring up EKGs, uh, they can track and graph uh, lab results over many years. Uh, this is what uh, uh, really many people consider the future uh, of where medicine should be going in terms of electronic medical record. The computer also reminds us uh, to uh, provide the full array of preventive health care and manage chronic conditions such as diabetes. And nowadays, healthcare measures quality. It's uh, commonly, we have report cards and so forth that look at the quality of care. And the current performance of VA New England and of this clinic, the clinic in Brattleboro, the clinic in White River Junction, is outstanding. The current performance is, uh, is in the top 10% of every single measure and often considerably exceeding this benchmark. The Joint Commission is the main accrediting body for healthcare organizations. And our hospitals in New England, the VA hospitals, are among the top 10% of hospitals in Joint Commission scores. Considerably better than USA News and World Report best hospitals in America. Furthermore, while the VA provides direct care, we spent most of our attention and our effort on providing direct care to over 6 million veterans. It serves the nation in other important ways as well. We have other missions which we're helping society in general. It's the largest provider of medical education in the country, and New England alone, VA supports almost 600 interns, residents, and fellows, and contributes to the education of almost 10,000, that's just in New England alone, 10,000 healthcare trainees a year from many disciplines. We partner with some of the finest medical schools in the country, including uh, White River Junction's close affiliation with Dartmouth Medical School. As we look to this new clinic, I also would like to thank the uh, tireless efforts of so many people, Senator Shaheen, the other congressional representatives, uh, Senate, uh, Director Walton, uh, who went through many meetings, many telephone calls, and many of the staff here at White River Junction. I see many people out there. This expansion was needed, and this is what delivered. White River Junction, I want to mention a couple things about White River Junction that it has had the unique distinction. It's the only VA medical center in the country, I believe, that has been the recipient of the Secretary of Veterans Affairs Carey Award for Excellence for nine consecutive years, evidencing their dedication to providing high quality care. It's really a very special organization. It also was honored to receive the highest award in Vermont for organizational excellence, the Governor's Trophy. So. When we, uh, what this means for veterans and families is that in collaboration with the integrated health care system that we provide in the region, VA New England, that this new clinic will indeed be providing exceptional health care, and that's what our mission is. 
So I wish the staff of this facility, Dr. Blackwood and others, many years of success. I've certainly uh, very much enjoyed being a physician and a health care provider for veterans uh, over the many years. It's been a, uh, and I'm sure you will too. They're a great group of uh, individuals to take care of. And it's a special uh, privilege to be providing them health care. So I wish you many years of success and rewarding work. But most importantly, I want to thank all the veterans here today for their service. And I promise the full support of VA New England Health Care System and the clean CBOC uh, and, the, and the veterans it serves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mailsman. Before I call upon Chaplain O'Keefe to do the benediction, I'd like to thank the, uh, several organizations who provided support for this event. The Keene Elks, the Keene Elks Past Presidents, the Fraternal Order of Eagles Past Presidents, the Keene American Legion Post 4 and their Color Guard, the Keene Chapter of Vietnam Veterans. Uh, especially, we'd like to thank, you'll see him out on the street, the uh, Keene Police Captain Steve Russo. He's a veteran himself. He volunteered his time to come in to help direct traffic out on the street. So if you see him, please thank him. Also, I'd like to acknowledge one group who's here today who uh, supports the clinic on a daily basis, and that's the Home Health Care Hospice and Community Services, who do provide support to the clinic. Great day. Everybody look at the cameras. Look at the cameras. Let me know when you guys are ready to take your Okay. Uh, we're going to count on three. One, two, three. Woohoo!